Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House. And of course, in the co-captain's chair, as he is every Friday morning, Mr. Martin Popoff. Good morning, my friend. Yes, morning, sir. Morning, sir. What do you what do you what have you got out there? <laughs> Nothing but blue skies. Yeah, us too. Yeah, yeah. Real, yeah. real nice out today. It's a little chilly, but it's uh, but it's really nice. I think it's yeah. gonna be in the low to mid 60s today, which uh, for this week is a little warm because it's been kind of cold this week and really windy. I don't know about yeah. by you, but man, windy, windy, windy. Yeah. So uh, I guess the spring is finally, hopefully here. So well, it's see. a depressing day up here in Toronto because our Raptors went lost big time last night. So they're kicked out of the NBA playoffs in the first round, and which is kind of a drag. But, uh, you know, we, we have the memories of actually winning it recently, and that was really cool, and the party was huge and all that. But, yeah, too bad. They were, they were more or less tied at halftime, and then they just lost by like 37 points or something. Oof! Wow, that's that's yeah, a, it was big, a big, big blowout at the end. That's a big blowout. Yeah, yeah as far as sports go, the, the the exciting thing in my in my side is uh, the whole craziness with the Mets of late getting hit by uh, you know pitches and getting into the little bit of a brawl with the St. Louis Cardinals the other day, and that's been the wow. talk of like New York sports for the last uh, yeah. twenty four to forty eight hours. But uh, anyway, uh, before yeah, we the do, Jays uh, are doing their usual, doing okay, and then it's going to just go and go and go, and then they'll they'll you know one hundred and fifty games later they'll be they'll be like five games above 500 or five below or 10 above and then they won't make the playoffs I well mean, i gotta hopefully say it works better than that but i hope that's not the case because yeah. as everybody probably knows uh i i'm a new yorker and in new york you're either a mets fan or a yankee fan i'm a mets fan uh, I don't like the Yankees and I hope, you know, Toronto's got a very talented young team. And I think that whether it's this year or next year, you have to think that they're going to break out big. And I really hope that they win the East this year. You know, Tampa's got a really good team. You can never count the Red Sox out. And of course you can never count the Yankees out. So, uh, you know, I, I, it's funny. I was watching some replays. I know all the Yankee fans are going to hate to hear this, but I was watching some replays of some games the last couple of days, highlights and things, man, that new Yankee stadium ballpark. It's not new anymore. It, like anybody could, I could hit a home run out of that ballpark. It's amazing the offense that comes from that team, but like that, like right field porch is like what two hundred and seventy five feet away from home plate. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So uh, it's just like they have such an advantage. But anyway, yeah. that's a story for another day. Before we All go right. on today, I do want everybody watching to please wish Martin a happy birthday from yesterday. Happy yeah. birthday, my friend. Uh, hopefully you, you had much. a good day and yeah. uh, birthday weekend coming up. Any any plans? Absolutely. I'm not sure. Not sure what I'm going to get up to this weekend, but, uh, but yeah, had, had a good day yesterday and a lot, lot of, a lot of Facebook messages and stuff. So it was pretty cool. Cool. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah if you're cool. like me, birthdays are just like another day. It's at this point, but yeah. I know a lot. Yeah, I'm not a big birthday guy, you know, yeah, you I'm see all either. those posts of you know, all the rock stars and their birthdays all the time. It's like, Oh, it's kind of cool that you're reminded of them or whatever, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So today uh, we are going to be tackling, uh, we've talked about on the channel quite a bit, these like uh, like one album wonders and one and done bands. So Martin and I were talking, I said, well, what about, you know, we've talked about a lot of them, but we've never actually attempted to pick out like our favorites. So what we've done today is we've picked out our 10 favorite one album bands. So we're not really talking about our favorite albums per se, but more like which of these bands that only ever released one album that we really kind of like the most. And I guess it goes without saying that we dig these albums as well. That's why we're picking them. But I think, uh, especially on, uh, on some of the ones that I picked, I think the bands were pretty terrific and it's a shame we only got the one album. One album is great too. We really like the bands, right? I mean, Martin, I don't know if you want to expand on that at all, but. Yeah, I, I guess one thing that differentiates a little from some things we might have talked about on obscurities and whatnot is that, you know, there, there's a lot of really crazy, weird, you know, outfits or groups that only made one album, but it might be just like a solo artist or a couple of people and you don't really know much about the band. It didn't even really feel much like a band. So so these, these I think, feel a little more like a band and we are talking kind of favorite bands that do this. You know, the other thing is, my list is, is sort of in chaos and I have a lot of honorable mentions and I'm not even feeling like the lower rungs of these very much. So, so to add some, some sort of uh, substance kind of thing, um, you know, I, I've got a fair number of honorable mentions just to mention this idea of, of these things, but it, it was funny going through this and, and uh, it was hard to actually 
I even find them and remember them. So I'm sure I've forgotten a lot of really good ones, but, you know, I kept adding and adding to it and whatnot, but, you know, there, there are, there are solo projects by, by, you know, one person in that. And I didn't, didn't really kind of count that there are, there are super groups that really weren't really a band. And I, I knocked one of those out. So, and then I, then I found like, Oh, these guys made one album and I've thought that for years and years and years. And then I go check. It's like they reunited and did another one or whatever a different lineup and that happened a lot for a lot of my metal uh, choices right yeah i mean most of those guys do come back later and and make a reunion album and stuff so so that happened a lot so uh without further ado um i'll get into my first choice here and i, I won't probably natter on too long about all these because like i say i i almost want to de-emphasize the 10 and say you know as a concept and then mention the honorable mentions a, a, a little bit more than usual but i'm gonna go with Vi, Sex and Religion. So this was this was the only album by the band called Vi. And the amazing thing, of course, with this is that, uh, and pictured right there as well, um, Devin Townsend is, is in the band. So this is Devin and Steve Vi, two, you know, creative geniuses, one of them more of a, a troubled creative genius, uh, uh, more, more than, you know, De Devin definitely during this time, it was, it was just we a weird time for him. He was young. He was like, you know, thrust out of Canada into the LA thing and all the hype around this. I really uh, ended up not, not when it first came out, but I really ended up playing this album a lot over the years. Um, and, and had a big, big period there where I played it like, you know, many, many times for a bunch of months in, in a row. It's just, uh, and it, it's a little bit of a, a, a taking the piss out of hard rock or heavy metal kind of album because it's a little comedic and weird because Devin, Devin is a little bit, ironic in all things he does and steve vi even on the guitar is kind of like a weirdly ironic comedic thing uh you know over the top um and and making fun of guitar heroes in a certain way with the way he plays so they kind of go well together here and there's that famous song on here that's a that's like a power ballad where Devin's singing through the whole thing and, and he actually doesn't even sing any words it's just like it sounds like lyrics, but it's not. So, so yeah, this was a, this was a pretty cool band and it was, I think, destined not to last uh, just because of the strong personalities in the band. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. I wasn't the only one who didn't really get that album when it first came out because I was a huge fan of passion and warfare. And I was like, all right, I want more of this. And then that came out and I was kind of like, all right, this is different. And, uh, you know, I think Devin Townsend, when you first hear him, he's, he's a kind of an acquired taste, right? I think over the years, we've all grown to love him uh, for a great singer and instrumentalist and songwriter. But uh, I think at the time, it was, that album was kind of jarring. And I didn't really get it at first. And it wasn't until many, many years later that I really kind of accepted. And it's like, okay, this is actually really, really good. But uh, yeah, I'm not surprised that's all we ever got from them. So... And to kind of reiterate what Martin was talking about before, um, this was difficult to put together because I think there are a lot of really good bands who only ever did one album. Uh, but, you know, in many cases, there were probably reasons why they only did one album. And so for me, I had to, I did a whole series like a year or two ago on uh, one and done bands or one album wonders or something like that. And I went and rewatched all 12 episodes that I did in that series to kind of remind myself of some of the bands that I talked about. And surprisingly, a lot of the ones that I talked about on those shows, you know, not really great bands, not really good out al great albums. They're okay. Right. So I had to kind of like go through and kind of weed out what I feel were some of the best bands and some of the albums I think made more of an impact on me. So, you know, my top 10 here, I'm fairly happy with it, but as I'm as when we go through the honorable mentions, there's plenty of others that I like quite a bit as well. So I, I felt bad about leaving some out, but thankfully Martin and I were in agreement that we're going to really go through the honorable mentions, and we have a lot of them. So with all that being said, my number ten here uh, is a band from Berlin, Germany, who released uh, their one and only album Dirtbox in 1972. The band is called Blackwater Park, and the album is called Dirtbox. Notable for the fact that Michael Ackerfeld of Opeth 
loves these guys. I mean, he he's interesting. I always kind of follow whenever he talks about some of the obscure music that he listens to. I always go and listen to him and, and go and investigate his choices because he likes a lot of really weird, obscure bands. And in most cases, the stuff that he likes has really resonated with me. So, of course, he named the Blackwater Park album and song after these guys. What a good, cool band. I mean, it's very much the product of its time. But here you got these two guitarists, bass and drums. It's kind of like proto metal, but it's they're kind of also kind of their label is a prog band, although I don't know how progressive they really are. But it's just good, dark heavy rock it's very german sounding so but it's not quite kraut rock and the band's got a lot of attitude the guitars on this album are tremendous uh the vocals are pretty good i i really dug this and it's, i only just got this like maybe a year year and a half two years ago and it's just amazing sometimes when you have these really obscure bands that uh you know obviously haven't been anything in you know 50 years and you discover like this like so much later and really get a lot of enjoyment out of it so i i this was like a late entrant into my top 10 because i had another band up here but i really dig this a lot and uh michael ackerfeld if you're watching thank you for turning me on to these guys yeah that was a pretty heavy one and, and another one along that i i hope to see all these i don't know what your choices are but i remember night sun morning and harry chapter tiger b smith i think they might have had two Deshin, Deshin was a cool one I that is a good one yeah dally yeah. uh, thing on it from from that and, and that you're right that is closer to hard rock that's closer to a lucifer's friend than a than you know, i would agree with that yeah or whatever yeah. yeah like the first lucifer's friend album yep yeah, absolutely yeah yeah okay so my next choice is um manitoba's wild kingdom and you and it's a little bit of a cheat because it's essentially a dictator's album by any other name and i i love the dictators i mean this had this had a handsome dick manitoba leading the thing andy Chernoff, jp thunderbolt patterson and ross the boss so there's pretty much your your um your your dictators lineup daniel ray who helped out a lot with the uh, the ramones was part of this as well uh but i remember when this came out there was a lot of hype around it weird uh a weird thing about it is it's about 28 minutes long it's got 10 songs they're all two or three minutes long but the big ones on here were the party starts now space exclamation mark exclamation mark ridiculous dwi was such a cool cool tune on here um new york new york was good um Haircut and an attitude was pretty good too. It's very, very dictators, but it's also very modern day dictators in that it's got uh, too many of these really fast, almost hardcore kind of annoying songs on it. Um, and um, that's one thing I don't like about the DFFD album, although I love the songs that I love on. It's the same thing with this one. So yeah, this is a bit of your Anderson Bruford Wakeman Howe kind of cheat uh, in that it's really a dictators album. Um, and the other reason I wanted to pick this is I actually saw these guys live, which is quite bizarre. Um, you know, when I first moved to Toronto, I saw these guys at a, at a venue that was on its way to closing legendary venue up here called rock and roll heaven that only saw a few bands at, cause it was, it was going to close shortly after I got here, but yeah, I, I saw them at rock and roll heaven. So there you go. Manit Manitoba's wild kingdom, stupid band name, and then stupid, uh, album title as well and i realize it's really stupid because yeah of course uh so on the front cover it's dot space space dot and you question mark and of course on the spine there are three dots so of course you know they, they never get this stuff right right um but yeah pretty ridiculous uh really 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 dumb title because you don't know how to type that right you know i'm sure no one wrote about this band because they didn't want to type any of that stuff right <laughs> <laughs> so there you go <laughs> and, and i love the uh the, the kind of offbeat comparison to anderson Bruf anderson bruford wakeman how who i completely forgot i'm going to insert them into my honorable mentions <laughs> list right now i got, yeah. forgot all about them yeah that that's the perfect example all right my number nine uh bbm around the next dream who released their one and only album in 1994. Of course, that's uh, uh, Ginger Baker, Jack Bruce, Gary Moore. There they are right there. You know, the yeah. two guys from Cream looking old and crusty there, right? Uh, you know, this, this should have been a really big deal. And, you know, basically what they were trying to do is come up with like a Cream for the 90s. And I really thought it worked. I really like this album a lot. And I have been a Gary Moore fan since the early 80s. And I've always 
you know, wanted him to be like one of the most famous guitar players on the planet. And I think, you know, with uh, the still got the blues era, with you know, all this blues stuff, I think that was starting to happen. But still, you know, blues is only going to get so popular. But, you know, Ginger and Jack really hadn't been doing anything of note for quite a while. These guys get together. They put out this album. It sounds like a like a heavier cream album, you know, for the 90s. They went out and did this tiny tour of the UK. Uh, the album Eh, it sold okay. It didn't sell that that great. Uh, they did some festival gigs, and then before you know it, that was it. You know, not surprising because I'm sure we we've, we've talked about here before how uh, difficult uh, Jack and Ginger can be to work with. And uh, Gary was probably like thinking, well, you know, this is cool. I, I love Cream. I love Clapton. We'll hook up with like these two legends. We'll make some music. It'll be really cool. And probably figured pretty early on that these two guys were just completely wacky to work with, which is a shame. But I, I dig the album. I think Gary's uh, playing on it is great. I think they complement each other well, but it just never went anywhere, sadly. But again, what year is it? 1994. Is this kind of like old school blues rock going to catch on in 1994? Absolutely not. If they did it. 10 years earlier, maybe, but not in 94. Yeah. And speaking of 10 years earlier, I don't even know if I'm getting this close, but there was also BLT, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, which is, is that Bruce Lord and Trower? Yep. Is it Bruce, yes, with the sandwich on it, right? Yeah, yep. so, which is a phenomenal album. Yeah. 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 Actually, that might have been, it might have been earlier than 84. So that was probably maybe 82. Okay. 83. They did two albums, two albums together. Oh, did they? Okay. Yeah. So yeah they, they did, they did another, the, another one of these disqualified ones, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They yeah. Did two. And actually, you know, uh, Trower and Bruce did three together, but with a different drummer. Uh, and, that, and that's the thing that, you know, so technically that first album with the sandwich on the front could be picked because they had every time that Trower and Bruce worked together, there was a different drummer involved. So right. technically, uh yeah. you could pick the blt album which i didn't even think of i like that album a lot a yeah. lot i even like that album better than this one so yeah. but. <laughs> cool all right uh my next choice is uh eater so this is the cd of eater this is called all of eater uh and i couldn't find my vinyl maybe i don't have it anymore but their their loan album was called the album and it had like a big red ant on the cover. Um, I don't even think it came out in America. But anyways, uh, these guys were were known. It was funny because they were super young. They, they did a cover of Alice Cooper 18 and they called it 15. And they did a cover of Queen Bitch, uh, S- uh, Sweet Jane as well. They had a very punky lead singer. Uh, lots of songs on the album. Like there were 17 songs or something on the album. On this one, all of Eater, it's got all their... 45s too they had a lot of picture sleeve 45s you know not the greatest um not not way up my list of favorite punk bands but i had a hard time finding even punk bands that made one album because most of them uh, you know most of the ones i liked did too and i think to get really obscure the drones i think maybe just had one uh x-ray specs which i'm not a big fan of um but yeah i don't i had a hard time finding too many of them that did one and i had a hard time even in the new wave of british heavy metal finding uh, f- finding one album once, but, uh, but yeah, I got, I got a lot of mileage out of Eater, the album at the time. It was a 77 album, I, I believe. So it was, um, you know, they, they were definitely an early punk band. It was well recorded. The guitars were a little thin on it, but yeah, their, their big shtick was, uh, uh, you know, in the press that they were super, super young. They were apparently like 15, 14 years old, which is just ridiculous to think about. Right. Uh, be, being in a band at that time, but, uh, yeah, Eater, there you go. Well, never heard of them. Never heard yeah. of them. <laughs> I don't think you'd like them. I mean, I, I don't think they're super high on, on any, it, it, it'd be hard. That's a whole episode. Like, like that whole idea of, of why, why would you like any punk? Right. Even, even the good stuff. There's, there's no, there's no real reason or point, but that's a whole nother episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, let's go back to 1972. I have a bunch of 72s on here for some reason. Uh, this one is considered by many people a, uh, a one and done gem in the history of progressive rock. And the album is uh, Space Shanty by the band Khan. I don't even know that. K-H-A-N. Oh, wow. cool. So this is, is very notable because it features a couple of guys who would become really big names in the Canterbury uh, scene. Notably Steve Hillage on guitar and vocals, who of course, really prominent solo career, was in Gong for quite a bunch, quite a few albums. Uh, Dave Stewart on keyboards, who went on to uh, Hatfield in the North, Egg, National Health, really, again, 
a very notable guy in the Canterbury product scene. Uh, Nick Greenwood on bass and vocals and Eric Peachy on drums. It's a very cool album. It's it's early prog. It's 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 kind of quirky. It's kind of jazzy. It's very psychedelic. It's got great keyboards and guitar, uh, interesting song structures and incorporates some classical music as well. Not it's not like um, it's not as easy listening initially on the ears as like, say, a Genesis or Yes, but this band was like really good at uh, using dissonance and uh you know, just kind of like jagged song structures and they really, really make it work. And, and it, it, they really gelled well together as musicians. Uh, and it's just interesting. They only ever did this one album, but I guess, you know, other opportunities came about. They took them and they went from being really obscure as this band to doing things in much, much more well-known bands going forward. So yeah, uh, Khan, Space Shanty is the album. Uh, really, really good band. It's a shame we only ever got one from them. Neat, yeah. Yeah, I didn't even think along those lines. I mean, that really opens the door to, uh, I, I bet there were a lot of those Vertigo bands that only made one album. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I, I hope this is one of your future choices, but Fields, uh, remember the Fields thing? They're in my honorable mentions. Yeah, that's another yeah. Great, great choice. Yeah, that, yeah. that was really good. good. Too. Yeah, yeah, from around that time. What a great, what a recording on that thing too. Wow. Yeah, beautiful yeah. album. Yeah, yeah, great, great album cover. Um, yeah. Tons of like really sumptuous arrangements. And yeah, that's a really good one. Yeah. yeah. All right. My next choice is California Breed. I don't even have a copy of this. I think Pete's got one on cue. There we go. Yeah. Uh, what a terrible album cover. Um, but I, I actually interviewed Glenn for that dang thing um yeah boy yeah I, I should have asked them for one you know after after a while in this journalism thing it, it it's almost uncool to ask them for a physical product as the years go on right they all freak out and say oh i guess i can try arrange it and figure it out and blah 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 especially mailing to canada like there's really crazy rates but anyway so i've interviewed a lot of bands lately where i don't even ask for the physical i never end up buying it but that is a great album um you know this was a cool situation where it it seemed hopeful that something cool was going to happen with these guys it's uh, it's glenn hughes jason bonham and uh andrew watt on guitar um and you know this is because i love um black country communion so much uh this this is like the the second coming of that and it is fierce like the bass tones he gets on it He's singing up a storm as usual. He's very melodramatic and vampy, of course, but um, but really kind of like powerful. But the bass is crazy powerful. It's one of Jason's most amazing performances of yeah. all time. He's one of my greatest, my, my favorite drummers <laughs> of all time. Um, but it was short lived because Jason Bonham uh, went off to another project. But uh, yeah, if you like Black Country Communion, there's no reason at all you, you wouldn't love this album. It's it's almost like even more out there and more powerful and artistic and creative and 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 and, and loose and chaotic. And uh, and it's just a really good record in that vein. Well, I think uh, it's a little less bluesy because obviously Bonamas is not involved. Uh, I think the, I, I agree with that. I think it's a very raucous, upbeat, rocking album. It's definitely more modern sounding than Black Country Communion, which was obviously trying to go for that yeah. kind of 70s feel. I think the one thing about this album that I, that, that just never really grabbed me is uh, I don't find Watt that, all that interesting of a guitar player. And I think, well, you know, one of the things I love so much about Black Country Communion is that, you know, all the distinctive things that each guy brings to the table. And I really miss that guitar virtuosity that you get with Bonamassa on BCC that you don't really get with from here. And uh, I heard that that came across quite a bit when they played some live shows. But yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that they, I think Glenn and Jason to an extent, really wanted to be able to go out and headline a tour and they couldn't get any headlining gigs. So they wound up like opening up, I think for Alter Bridge and, and Jason was like, ah, there's no money in that. And I think he wound up playing drums on the Phil Collins tour, if I remember correctly, the solo tour. Okay. And that was basically the beginning of the end for this sadly, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's some really strong songs on here. And you know, what was really cool is for many of us who were lamenting the fact that black country communion at the time, after the uh, was the third album, were basically no more. They Glenn put this together pretty quickly afterwards, so it kind of filled that gap. But then, as history shows, we did get another Black Country Communion uh, album not too long. Bad ago. album cover and and bad name of a band too. It's just kind yeah, of it's just not good. Yeah. yeah, and you know it's on Frontiers Records, right? So they they promote it as much as they promote it, and yeah, it's yeah. 
All right. Uh, I'm going to stay in 1972 once again for a really cool band. I've had the CD. I bought this CD by chance, like, uh, God, like in the 90s. And I thought the album cover was terrific and it was highly talked about. So I took a chance on it and I love it. I love the band and they only ever did one album. It's a Scottish band. The band is called Bodkin. That's right. Look at that evil looking goat wow. thing on the front. B-O-D-K-I-N. Yeah, I recall that uh, one either. Yeah. Really, really hard rocking album. I'll, I'll put it to you this way. If you love vintage Atomic Rooster, you ride a heap deep purple with a little bit of like uh, iron butterfly and vanilla fudge on top. That's what yeah. you get here. Long songs. I mean, uh, like, you know, nine minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes, six minutes, only five tracks, big Hammond organ, crunchy guitar, great vocals, upbeat songs. It's kind of moody and spooky sounding in spots. And this band just kills. And I think if uh, memory serves me right, they were really young when they did this, like late teens, early 20s. And they just never did another album. And, and you know, the whole the whole CD is like really, really cool. It folds up like in all sorts of different ways and stuff. It's one of those Akarma records, uh, the Italian yeah. label. Yeah. Uh, really, really good. I have been like kind of promoting this for 30 years or close to 30 years whenever I got this uh, this CD. It was sometime in the 90s. But yeah, excellent, excellent band. Never did another album, unfortunately. Hmm. cool all right uh my next choice uh is uh pride and glory um i i don't know if you've picked did, was this one of yours too or no i forgot all about that it's a great pick good yeah. okay so um and there's my original of it and uh and this is the reissue In, interviewed uh zach for the reissue um you know they did a nice nice digi pack of it great band shot right yeah cool looking band um so yeah this is this was a one and done uh you know obviously uh he's he's got he uh, another famous job of course um playing guitar for ozzy but uh this is essentially the precursor to black label it sounds like black label except it's uh it's bluesier it's got more of a um super large major label sounding drum sound to it um it's got zach's really cool that that coagulated cough syrup greg greg allman kind of vocal that he has in his voice i love that voice of his uh love his singing um but yeah just a just a really cool heavy hard-hitting bluesy you know redneck metal album beard pulling album as they as they say or as i say losing your mind was i i just loved the opening track on this um but yeah really really cool uh band um, they got some good opening slots. I can't remember who they played for, but they they did they did get some good touring in. Um, but yeah, it was just not to be. I guess it didn't do as well as as it should have. But uh, yeah, I I just like the fact that it's a uh, it's a combination of his uh, no, notorious one gig stint in uh, in the Almond Brothers with uh, with what Black Label would become. Um, but but you know maybe a little black crows to it as well um but uh but I, I i love the whole idea of black label and this and this really does sound like a precursor to black label yeah i mean it's uh we were my friends and i were totally into that when it came out and we were thinking man this is like a really great hard rock and modern southern rock album basically you know because yeah. we know how much he loves the southern rock bands and uh and his love for sabbath so yeah not quite as heavy as black label definitely bluesier and more kind of countrified i i think that's a terrific yeah. choice i totally forgot about that one badlands too it's in the wheelhouse of Badlands. yeah yeah not too far from that yeah exactly exactly cool yeah. All right, my number six, uh, and I can't find my CD anywhere, so sorry, everybody, but uh, the self-titled debut from 1984 from Orion the Hunter. Yep. Uh, a huge Boston fan. I remember when that album came out, uh, I was all over it because, quite frankly, it just sounded like Boston. You had Barry Goudreau, guitarist from Boston, kind of leading the band. You had this guy named Fran Cosmo on lead vocals who kind of sounded a little bit like Brad Delp. You had Brad Delp on backing vocals on the album. Fran actually then went and sang for Boston uh, a couple of years later. Bruce Smith on bass, Michael DeRozier on drums. Uh, that song, the single, So You Ran, was all over FM rock radio at the time. Big hit. I saw the band open for Aerosmith on the big reunion tour that summer, which you know got them in front of a lot of people. The album sold pretty decently. Uh, it it kind of had that big arena rock sound, you know, the big, well-produced guitars, the soaring vocals, anthemic choruses, all that sort of thing. But man, after the tour, 
that was it. Never saw another thing from the band again. And I think uh, we kind of a missed opportunity because I think that style of music uh, was all the rage throughout the rest of the eighties. And if they would have just stayed together, um, you know, who knows what they could have done together, but it was not meant to be. And uh, yeah, great album. I still listen to it to this day. I, I enjoy it quite a bit. Really good, accessible, hard rock music. Yeah, that's an interesting one. It, it, it almost just reminds me of that that era where, uh, I mean, there was that Freddie Salem album, right? And there was, uh, oh boy, you know, it reminds me like Alan Collins band. Uh, there there were just yeah. these these odd one-offs going on. I, our, Orion, was was that on CBS, I think? A portrait. So it might have been. Would, yeah, portrait, yeah, yeah, you know, there, there, were, there were a bunch of major label things that were just one and done. So maybe there was kind of a trend at, at, at one point of, uh, of of that happening but uh could be yeah. but I, you know they they saw some success and you know like i said they were on the big tour so i i was shocked that they never did anything else and then barry turns up you know a couple of years later with that uh, rtz return to zero thing uh which right. was very similar yeah you know yeah i don't know all right okay my fifth choice i'm feeling better about this the, the higher end of these although some of these i might have talked about before on, on other shows but mother love bone um you know, love the whole grunge thing. When we were talking about the cult the other day, I was tickled pink when Jamie was saying how much into grunge he was at the time. That was really cool to hear. Um, but uh, but yeah, this this is a this is a big one and done. It's a huge legendary album. It's called Apple. Um, and it's been reissued a bunch of times. Uh, but the whole deal here is that Andrew Wood, the lead singer of the band, you know, looked kind of like the, like a rock god kind of thing. Although I don't think he was a very big guy, but he had the long hair and stuff. He died of a heroin overdose, March nineteenth, nineteen ninety. Um, so that that was it for them. You know, obviously there's there's been a lot of that going on in the grunge scene. But the cool thing about this band was that it it was uh, it, it was giving giving a little bit back to uh, to to down the coast to L.A. It was a little bit Guns and Roses, a little bit Aerosmith uh, mixed with a with a grunge aesthetic. So it was it was. You know, people would say that possibly the first Alice in Chains and then Alice in Chains definitely before they even made that that first album facelift were were a little bit of a crossover band between big hard rock, whether it's the big hard rock mixed with the 70s and hair metal uh, and grunge. Th this was the other band that was a little bit like that. So it's a it's a little funky, straightforward. It's a little bit stadium rocking. So it's pretty accessible uh, for a lot of people. Um, and in terms of all the, the albums that are well respected out of Seattle that are part of the grunge scene, you know, this definitely is the more mainstreamy one, but it was definitely a classic. Uh, people loved it right out of the gates and, and thought this band was going to be huge. Yeah, that's one of those bands that people took when they look back on the grunge scene. They talk about the the really influential bands, not not only uh, you know to the to the listeners, but to the the bands and the musicians themselves. They always come up in conversation. Yeah. Yeah. All right, 1970, Quatermass. Oh right, yeah. One and done album, uh, a prog classic in my opinion. A uh, trio, basically, again, a lot of people always say, oh, they kind of took the whole ELP thing. But in actuality, they came out right around the same time as ELP. So they weren't really copying everything, maybe taking a little bit from the nice, right, which was Keith Emerson's band prior to ELP. Yeah. Uh, this was uh, Peter J. Peter Robinson on keyboards, tremendous player. John Gustafson, who bass and vocals, who, of course, went on to Ian Gillen Band and Roxy Music and Mick Underwood who played with uh, Ian Gillen for many, many years on drums. Uh, just a tremendous album, amazing, amazing blend of like rock and classical uh, song structures and just highly engaging keyboards. You don't even miss guitar on here at all. And it's aggressive, it's energetic, and these guys just could play their asses off and uh, never did another album, although, to bring up your point from the beginning of the show, this is one of those bands where many, many, many years later, they reappeared in some other reformation. I don't remember who was the one member who uh, kind of started it up, but they did a Quatermass 2 album like 30 or 40 years later. And I, I kind of look at that the same way I look at like Coliseum and Coliseum 2. They're completely different bands. Yeah. So I'm going to include this one today. And this, without a doubt, is a prog rock classic from the early 70s. Again, if you like that kind of like keyboard led power trio like ELP, uh, very, very similar, but they were actually contemporaries of ELP and they were not copying their stuff at all. So yeah, Quatermass, 1970. 
And they caused Rainbow, right? With uh, Black Sheep. Yes, of the right. Family. Yeah, Black Sheep of the Family, right? That's a good, great point. So Richie Blackmore was totally into that song. And that was, you know, he wanted to do a remake of that song. He wanted to have Ronnie James Dio sing it. Ronnie was an elf at the time opening up for Purple. And that that's what's got the whole Rainbow idea in his head. So, yeah, great point. I forgot to bring that up. Never understood that. Out of all, all the songs that could inspire a great band like Rainbow, why that song? It's just yeah. Not, it's not even the best song on this album like yeah, not even exactly close, right? exactly yeah all right my next choice uh i have talked about these guys before so i'll keep it brief but dmz out of boston um there's that cool band photo again yeah. um this is def definitely a legendary one and done a little less legendary over time just like when i was talking about the dictators i was thinking about you know what you know 10, 15, 20 years ago, people would always talk about the Dictators as a big deal and a legendary band, and that it was always linked to the Stooges and and MC5 and uh, and the New York Dolls, and people don't really talk about the Dictators much anymore. And DMZ definitely fell by the wayside. Um, you know, although this this was definitely always on a on a lower lower scale, but so this is kind of like a a, a well recorded um, garage rock crossed with punk uh, mono man uh the 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 lead the lead singer there big musicologist guy went on and did an even more garagey retro band called liars um you know they had some singles the lift up the hood ep uh but yeah mighty id bad attitude this is like the heavy stuff on here sounds like heavy metal stooges kind of uh destroyer there's a little bit of a destroyer reminds me that a little bit of it sounds kind of twisted sisterish at at times as well it, it's got a simplicity attitude is produced by flo and eddie um and uh yeah photography mick rock that's interesting too um but uh but yeah this was just a good quality at 1978 on sire um and kind of like the dictators, um, they're a little bit in that uh, long-haired punk rock group situation in a way, right? There were some some of these bands um, from the East Coast would be punk rock, but they wouldn't look punk rock, which right. is kind yeah. of interesting. And DMZ is a bit like that one. So there you go. How the hell did they ever hook up with Flo and Eddie to produce their albums beyond? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a strange one. Yeah. All right, my number four is from 1993, Coverdale Page. Right. So this album, I still think, is really, really great. And it just kind of, the, the meeting of these two guys made perfect sense. You know, you had uh, White Snake, which was, you know, basically on the outs. You know, Coverdale kind of blew his voice out a little bit there on that long uh, slip of the tongue tour. Obviously, Jimmy Page hadn't really been doing much of anything for many, many years. You know, The Firm is done. He did uh, The Outsider album, but Jimmy's not, you know, and then that's the story of Jimmy Page over the last, you know, 40 years, right? What is he doing? We don't know. So they were both kind of looking for something to do. They kind of hooked up together and Coverdale has always had that kind of like Robert Plant stigma around him anyway. They get together, they do this album. I think it's great. I mean, it's just big bluesy stadium rock and they had stuff played on the radio. They had a couple of videos on MTV, but they went to do the tour of Japan and they had this whole tour planned for here and it never happened. And then that was it. And before you know it, uh, Jimmy is playing with Robert again and Coverdale is eventually putting Whitesnake back together again. But man, some great songs on here. Shake My Tree is, is awesome. Uh, I love like even the ballady stuff on here, like uh, Take Me For A Little While, Pride and Joy was the big single. Uh, feeling hot rocks take a look at yourself another great ballad uh absolution blues i think jimmy sounds great on this he's playing tremendous i think his playing is way better on this album than on either one of those firm albums and uh coverdale sounds great so i i, I dig this i was shocked that this just kind of fizzled and the band never finished the tour and never did anything else because i thought it made perfect sense for both guys at the time but again it's it's 1993 right what's really popular in 1993 so not not a good time well and to stay topical there there's a there's a lot you know between that and i believe uh no yes it's 94 so uh you know pride and glory is a little bit like that album and blue murder is a little bit like that album yeah as well, right yeah. Yeah. yeah just just big almost maybe too many layers maybe a little overworked but big stadium rock i think it's the second greatest thing jimmy ever did after led zeppelin first i would put walking into clarksdale which i yeah. love 
Yeah. Um, but yeah. There's so much guitar on the album. I mean, he's, he sounds yeah. amazing on it. And that's like, that's, you know, we, since then, right. We want more of that. And it's just, it's just yeah. amazing. We haven't gotten anything. Yeah. And that's, and that's when he looked most like a hair metal guy too, with the big hair. And, <laughs> yeah. He totally did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, all right. So uh, my next one, I have talked about this as well, but there's a reason I'll, I'll, I'll say uh, the ghost, uh, the ghost Birmingham 1971, uh, Shirley Kent on vocals, very scary, creepy album. It's called When You're Dead One Second. I, I wanted to pick this because I felt like I didn't want to talk about Trader Horn or the search party or these trails like these other obscure things I talked about possibly in the same episode, but this really was a band. And, uh, and there they are, the uh, one, two, three, five of them. Um, and uh, yeah, just a, just a creepy, psychedelic, slightly occultish, weird hippie, almost like Charles Manson vibe uh, to the whole thing. A um, little bit of Richie Blackmore to the guitar. Uh, for a 71 album, it sounds a little dated. It sounds very much like a 69, 68 album, but a heavy 69, 68 album. And there, there's your band. You know, they're, they're looking all... All serious Birmingham rock and roll there. So there, there's your song titled. It's Night of the Warlock. Crazy, crazy song. Uh, when You're Dead, Hearts and Flowers. Hearts and Flowers died today. Um, yeah, this is, this is, you know, this is one of those $600,000 albums in the original. Yeah. This is, this is kind of a fakey, fakey reprint. Uh, album of it but uh, there you go the ghost i like that a lot when you brought them up like geez i don't know a year ago whatever you, that one episode where you talked about them, i went and listened to that on, on uh, youtube that's a pretty good album pretty good album really hard to get though unfortunately yeah yeah all right so uh let's go to italy 1973 for one of the weirdest and kind of coolest album covers of all time semi ramus dedicato a franz or a wow. sorry okay. I mean, look at that. Does that make a statement right there? No, no band name on the front, no album title, no nothing. Just this kind of whatever, <laughs> whatever that's supposed to be. Uh, Italian Prog Band, 1973, their one and only album. K absolutely killer. If you love symphonic hard rock and prog rock from this era, specifically, you know, with the really over the top uh, semi operatic Italian vocals, big keyboard and guitar riffs. This is one of the great Italian prog albums of the 70s. And it's a shame they only did one. Uh, I'm going to here, I'm going to attempt to read the name of the band, the names of the bands and uh, butcher some of them. Pa Paolo Faenza, Marcello Redavide, Giampiero Artegiana, uh, Michele Zarillo, and Maurizio Zar Zarillo. Okay, on keyboards, guitars, bass, and drums, and vocals. Uh, tremendous. I don't really know what else to say about this album. It's, I've listened to this to death over the years, and this band was so good, so ferocious. And this album is as good as anything that Bonco or PFM or any of those other Italian greats were doing at the time. And uh, if you haven't heard this and you love Italian Prague, check it out. Semi Ramis, S E M I R A M I S. Uh, absolutely tremendous album dedicato a fraz f a f r a z z in fact i'll, I'll hold the, the back up seat and take a look at that there nice. so yeah tremendous 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 wow there probably are a lot of those one and done prog situations oh there. yeah there's tons of them i, I yeah i could have i could have done a whole list on them but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah quite a few all right okay my top two i feel pretty strongly about um green river Back to Seattle. So this is the legendary, legendary. Uh, I think it's, I, I rate this in my top three grunge albums of all time, possibly even first. Uh, so this is a band that uh, begat uh, Jeff Ament and Stone Gossard over to uh, Pearl Jam and Mark Arm over to Mud Honey. And Mud Honey was amazing as well, especially that first EP, Super Fuzz Big Muff. Uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce Fairweather, uh, went into Mother Love Bone after this as well. So it's a lot of pedigree to this. Um, they had an EP on Homestead called uh, Come On Down, which is like something like 1984. So they were kind of starting this really early. They're one of the one of the really early bands in this. And that's the front cover of their Dry as a Bone EP, which is also amazing. One of the great, great grunge EPs. This is just... Uh, Everything, if you love grunge, this is just everything uh, about 
what you might love about grunge in one place, like really cool riffing, creative, chaotic blue, you know, bluesy at times, doomy at times. It reminds me a little bit of, uh, of early Soundgarden. You've got your, your classic, you know, Charles Peterson photography of this band. You know, Mark Arm is just the quintessential grunge guy. He look, he's nobody looks more grunge than him, you know, with that sort of Dennis the menace, but with blonde hair look to him, you know, kind of thing. Um, but really amazing riffs, great lyrics, you know, all the reasons you, you needed to move on from hair metal and, and everybody moved on in droves kind of in, in a certain way, me as well, um, to, to loving this music out of Seattle. I was living in Vancouver at the time when all this was coming out. Um, it, it's all here in this, in this album, some amazing, amazing riffing on here. And just, uh, just that, that kind of wild and dangerous lightning in a bottle feel that you got out of some of that early grunge stuff like Nirvana Bleach and like I say, the early Soundgarden stuff. You just couldn't predict where it was going to go. It just seemed way more badass than what you were getting out of hair metal because that was all now on major labels and planned and expensive videos and all that stuff. So it, it's, I really feel, I really feel this, this transition from a certain kind of hard rock way more magical and well done than than the all that that narrative about punk leading on from prog and hard rock and state you know th this really was an important cool thing that happened this whole grunge thing loved it to death and i might i've never heard that album and i might need to investigate that because uh that sounds like that one might be up my alley i, I don't like a lot of the grunge stuff but I, there are some stuff that i can that i can appreciate yeah. so i'm going to check those guys out i think for you it'd be more like mother love bone and, <clears throat> and certainly alice in chains yeah i mean i love alice in chains i love Soundgarden. i do like the mother love bone album and uh but i've never heard those guys before you know yeah, this, it's like the mind. roots of that you'll hear some good guitar stuff going <clears throat> on in here um but uh yeah for, for the roots of all this i mean i mean to have these guys go into pearl jam mud honey and mother love bone it's it's pretty impressive cool all right like you uh i feel very strongly about my top two uh one i i you know as far as which one i rank one or two i don't know if it really matters i think my number two here is is leagues the better album uh but i have such history with the first one so that's why they're kind of ranked the way they are but this is absolutely tremendous this is probably like one of the uh the bands that have come up in the last 20 25 years that got such notoriety from this one album and people have been begging and screaming for them to get back together and do something else and we've seen them the members of the band all go off and do other things since and nothing really has ever matched their one and only album a septics universe by spiral architect from 2000 a great norwegian progressive metal band just absolutely one of the great debuts of all time it's it's produced spectacularly it's on ken golden sensory records ken golden for our esteemed colleague from in the prog seat uh you got to oivin heglin on vocals steinar gunderson on guitars lars norbig on bass and asgir mickelson on drums and asgir has done tons of great things over the years uh like i said these guys went on to do all sorts of other projects and bands on the norwegian scandinavian scene but man killer vocals absolutely jacked rhythms on here the guitar work is just off the charts it's really complex but it's very very memorable and these guys just you know lightning in a bottle right put a bunch of musicians together and they just create magic and then for whatever reason they just all went their separate ways and that was it but man if you haven't heard spiral architect you are really missing out if you're into like really melodic but technical progressive metal uh it's one of the best albums ever that has come out in that kind of like subgenre of metal really wow great. it's drawing a fair bit of a blank for me i mean i think i remember that coming and coming and going through my head right there's so many records uh in in the modern era that that are that are well done and and it's like it's like I'm sure there's a lot of one and dones too. I was trying to rack my brains thinking back to the brave words time, you know, like some of those legendary yeah. black metal super groups and stuff. Oh, yeah. And, and there, there are, there are some of those, but I, I just, there's a lot of them. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to look up stuff like that. Hard, hard to find, you know, who are, who are these one, one album ones. Right. But uh, yeah. all right. So my last one definitely felt strong. This had to be the one um, sex pistols uh maybe you knew it was coming but i mean I, I don't think i don't think there's a bigger more famous one album band in the history of the world um i i really you know 
I don't think anything can rival this. Um, and here's the crazy thing about the Sex Pistols. I think most people are probably under the misconception that they did many albums. And yeah. Really not, right? I mean, that's it. They had the Yeah, they had stuff. a lot of singles. They <laughs> yeah. had this this kind of weird compilation thing come out, uh the great rock and roll uh, swindle, right? Um which, uh, you know, c- compiles a bunch of their things. There's even even some funny stuff about auditioning for a new singer on here. And you hear those guys all singing a one song. It's, it's ridiculous. But but this album, um, it actually went platinum eventually. Um, and it's just a, a well-recorded, heavy start to finish. There's nothing mellow on it. It's all rocking. Big drums, big multi-track guitars, smart lyrics. Um, you know, Johnny Rotten is is probably an an acquired taste. Whether you like that style and that twanginess and that that punkness, I mean, he's he's a little he's a little odd. Who does he remind me of a little bit? Oh, something came to mind. But there, there's that there's that aspect of um, singing in a, in an English accent. You know, that's a whole big debate with these English bands. Uh, but the lyrics are really sharp and smart. Um, and there's those big gang vocals that sound like you know, football hooligan vocals on it. Um, it's just classic after classic, banger after banger. So much of this came out as singles, right? Anarchy in the UK, God Save the Queen. Um, Pretty Vacant were, was a big song. New York was a big song. Uh, Bodies, EMI, wow. There's just, just every song is just bang, bang, bang. It's, it's really cool. And all the singles were great on as well. So, you know, and, and talk about being a band. I mean, they played a bunch of times before the album, a bunch of times after they had a few reunions. They've got a live album later on. Um, just the, the biggest, like I say, the biggest single album uh, band of all time. It, it, it almost just felt like you, you can't repeat this the bass player goes and dies and they're all fighting and all that kind of stuff. And uh, they're getting banned all over the place, but yeah, there you go. Sex pistols. Never mind the bollocks. Yeah. Tell me venom weren't uh, influenced by the sex pistols. <laughs> right? Yeah. Funny. Yeah. All right. My number one, uh, I, I can't find the CD. So Martin was uh, kind enough to find his H S A S through the fire. Yep. That's uh, Sammy Hagar. Neil Sean, Kenny Aronson, Michael Shreve, of course, all four very notable guys at the time. So this is kind of like a uh, super group that you never knew you wanted, right? But you got it. This kind of came out with like little fanfare at the time. Uh, of course, you know, Sammy at, at that time in the early 80s was doing his solo thing. You had Neil making lots of money with, uh, with Journey. And Michael Shreve obviously was in Santana earlier on, did lots of solo stuff. Kenny Aronson was kind of like the, uh, the bass player to the stars, right? He was a Mr. Session guy. And they all kind of had a little break in their schedules. They did like uh, some like a couple live shows. They decided to put the album out. And it was kind of a decent hit, right? They had the single Whiter Shade of Pale, which was played all over the radio. Uh, they were they did like this MTV concert, which I remember watching thinking it was great. And I think the album just completely kicks ass. Uh, again, this the reason why this one is number one over Spiral Architect, even though that's a banger of an album. I, I had such history with this. I listened to this to death back in the day, and I've always loved Sammy's vocals. I think he sounds great on there. And if you want to hear Neil Sean just completely shredding it up, he does it all over this album. He's such a, a great guitar player. And, you know, within Journey, everything is for the song. Here, he's just, there's big riffs all over the place. His solos are crazy. Uh, Top of the Rock is a great anthemic hard rock song. Valley of the Kings, Missing You is a great ballad. Hot and Dirty Kills, My Hometown is like molten metal. I just, I love it. And I was like heartbroken that they never did anything else after this. Of course, you know, Sammy got the Van Halen call. Neil, when, you know, Journey had to go do something else, the other guys did whatever they were doing. And that was that. So, uh, I, you know, that's almost 40 years ago now. And I'm, I'm like shocked that those, especially Sammy and Neil never did anything else together since then, which is a real shame, but I, I love that band and I, I wish they would have kind of gone on from there, but you know, it's, it was destined to never, never go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's, it's bold to do a, a live album of all originals like that, except, you know, they had a bit of a hit with whiter shade of pale on here. I love my hometown on here. Yeah. Super it's great. One. Yeah. Yeah, Valley of the Kings, Giza, their kind of Zeppelin esque yeah. thing on here, but uh, yeah, good, good, exciting album for sure. Yeah, I love it. I love it. All right, honorable mentions. 
<laughs> Here we go. We're not going to talk a lot about these, but we're, we're going to just kind of rattle them off. This is a lot of good ones. So Martin, I'll have you, uh, Go through your list. Yeah, I've I've got a pretty long list here. Again, I I felt bad having having talked about some of these before. Um, so I do have a long list, and I I won't talk about them much. But I even had a had a few of them pulled here, um, because this was gonna get on my list. Uh, GTR, right? And there's the reissue CD of that. Um, you know, I got uh, got your, I don't know, one p.m. Did they ever make a two p.m.? I don't yes. think. So. <laughs> Carl Palmer situation, right? Yeah, yeah. Or did they ever make a five after one? Uh, Katmandu with Dave King. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, I, I had Subhumans. Uh, this is not the cover, but Incorrect Thoughts. But then I found out this morning, oh, they made other albums. Uh, yeah. But, you know, later on, but changed lineups. Temple of the Dog, I, I, um, I took out because it's more of just a straight project thing. I had Armageddon. Bogeyman, which was the side project, the, the Masters of Reality side project thing. Circle C, which was a slow, uh, you know, Vancouver legendary band side project thing. Um, you know, uh, Don Dawkin, Getty Lee, Victor, these single things. Jesus Christ was a was a Toronto grunge band, which was amazing. A really good one. Um, Holy Barbarians, which is uh, an Ian, Ian Asbury side project thing. The Professionals. Um, that's an interesting situation. Um, so, so Steve Jones and Cookie, Paul Cook, after the Sex Pistols imploded, they went off and started this band called The Professionals. And the first one got shelved by Virgin over a royalties dispute thing. And it eventually came out. It's heavy. It's a good, heavy rock. And it's almost like the second coming in the Sex Pistols. And then they did a second album uh, as well, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, I had a list here with uh, Ursa Major, Art, Supernatural yeah. fairy tales. Yep. Uh, Jerusalem maybe was just one. War Pig out of Canada, I think, was just one. Alamo, um, which is a good heavy southern rock thing. Um, them Crooked Vultures, uh, that super group with John Paul Jones and uh, and Josh Homey. Um, let's see. Uh, Page Plant is kind of cheating because they sort of had two, but one of them doesn't count. And uh, and one of them does count definitely as a, as a standalone album. Shadow King, Rock Pile. Um, rock piles kind of famed in this department when I was kind of looking up stuff. That's uh that's a, like a good pub rock super group when Dave Edmonds and Nick Lowe were both having a bit of their fame. They got together and did this one album damage plan, sadly with the Abbott brothers, um, Steve Gaines band, Alan Collins band, I mentioned, and then some not great ones, billion dollar babies, the Alice Cooper group, um, you know, without Alice Emerson Lake and Powell wildlife, Simon Kirk, the Law, Paul Rogers. So you got those two bands, not not that great. Pace Ashton Lord, um, Esquire, Rob Halford Two, um, Contraband, Dead Ringer, yeah. uh, which is uh, Dennis and Joe Bouchard. Maybe Neil was in that as well. Hughes Thrall, Saint Paradise, um, Rockstar Supernova. Remember, remember the big supergroup TV shows, right? Yep. So there was that one. And then there was a Ted Nugent one, right? He was part of a, one of these bands. And I think they made an album, right? And I, I've I totally so. forgot. Wasn't uh, Scott Ian in that thing? Possibly. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I don't know what they were called. I don't, know. <clears throat> I don't remember. American Freedom's got something to do. Uh, something like that is, is in there as well. I don't know. Um, but uh, and then the, the only one I can think about in the <laughs> whole new wave of British heavy metal was White Spirit. There were a couple lower ones that I didn't yeah, that's know a good one too. Good. Like yeah. I think there was Volts and uh, what was the other one? Original Sin maybe, um, but White Spirit was a pretty good one. Uh, they were on MCA that coughed up Yannick Gers. Yannick Gers, yeah, um, before he went to Gillen, yeah. Uh, to Gill, yeah, get, uh, yeah. This so he goes to Gillen next, and then yeah. and then he goes to to Maiden. Yeah. Um, and then uh, did not uh, who who uh, maybe 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 Ian Gillen didn't produce that one. Maybe he did. I can't remember. I think maybe he did. Uh, anyway, so White Spirit was the only one I could think of because most of those bands would would do a second album kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's a long list for you. I, I don't know. Oh, The Boys. The Boys. Too Wild to Tame. Uh, that was a really cool one on CBS. Uh, you know, what's his name? Cleveland Records. Um, oh, what was his name? Uh, and there's a Sven Galley who put some of these. He was involved with Meatloaf as well. Steve something we lost him recently but so this boys band was pretty cool they were like a blackfoot they were like a like a hard rock and heavy metal blackfoot um dan 
something or other as the lead singer. And then they only made the one album, Too Wild to Tame, where they're all out in front on their bikes, you know, in front of the old, you know, black and white photo. They're all kind of a big biker gang shot. And then and then they changed their name to The Biz, the B B apostrophe Z Z. And that was a mellower album. So there you go. Cool. Yeah, you mentioned some ones that I also had too, which is cool. So I won't bother with those. Uh, Beck Bogart and the Peace. Okay. Yeah. Pretty good band. I, I think could have been a tremendous band if they would have had a real singer. Um, Blackthorn with uh, Graham Bonnet and oh, yeah. uh, uh, Bob Kulik, right? And yeah. a couple other guys. Uh, Dr. Butcher, which they, oh, the one and done wow. band with Chris That's Caffrey great. and uh, John Oliva from Sabotage, which is pretty cool. A uh, New York band called Trigger. They played around here in the Hudson Valley oh, all yeah. the time. Really cool yeah. band. Mogul Thrash, uh, kind of like a proggy jazz fusion band featuring uh, early John Wetton. Uh, Blind Faith and Derek and the Dominoes. Yes. Which Those are two probably two of the more notable ones. I think you mentioned Armageddon, who are fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Boomerang, a great kind of like Hammond organ hard rock band featuring Mark Stein from uh, Vanilla Fudge. Yeah. Uh, Tin House, very cool 70s hard rock band. Island, they had an album called Pictures. Island was kind of like a, uh, a weird Van de Graaff generator, Gentle Giant ish prog band. I think they were from Iceland or something like that. Uh, Control Denied, which was the uh, band that Chuck Schuldner yeah. from Death put together after Death broke up. Really, really cool. Uh, Night, Sun, Morning, which we talked about earlier. Great German hard rock band. Tremendous, tremendous album. Shadow King yeah. with uh, Vivian Campbell and uh, Lou Graham from Foreigner. The band that actually was in my top 10 and got booted for Blackwater Park was Fuzzy Duck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, UK hard rock band made up of members from Tuck, equally obscure Tucky Buzzard, right? Uh, what else we got here? Attila. Yeah. <laughs> great great uh, two-piece band featuring Billy Joel on Hammond organ and vocals. Great, crazy band. Some people call it the worst uh, album ever made. I actually like it quite a bit, but um, uh, Two Gun, which were a great one and done Southern rock band. Uh, Danny Joe Brown man. Hmm. Great only yeah, album ever. Guy. Yeah, which uh, that's a really good Southern rock album. That one. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I'll stay on the Southern rock thing here. I have a black horse, I believe, who were from Texas, kind of like uh, maybe um, ZZ Top meets um, uh, Point Blank. Right. Really heavy, heavy, crunchy, bluesy Southern rock. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? What else? G Force featuring Gary Moore. Oh, yeah. Okay. Pretty cool. Uh, Axis featuring uh, Vinny from before his Sabbath days, right? It's a circus, circus world. world. Yeah, right? that's a really strong album. Danny Johnson on guitars, really, really good. Um, I mean, I got all sorts of other, uh, you know, prog stuff and things like that. And McChurch Sound Room, really cool. I believe they were German, kind of heavy prog band, Delusion. Um, Players, a really great jazz fusion band featuring... Uh, uh, Scott Henderson on guitar, Steve Smith on drums, and uh, uh, Mr. Berlin on bass, and uh, T. Lavitz from the Dregs on keyboards. That's a tremendous, tremendous album. That also could have made my uh, could have made my list. Uh, you know, Spring Fields. I mean, you know, there's, there's so many other bands. I mean, there's a ton of them. So I'm not going to go and name them all. Power of Zeus, great uh, heavy rock doom band. Orangutan. <laughs> yeah crazy stuff there's, there's tons of them but you know i think uh, we got some of the the more notable ones so uh yeah, yeah. Cool. so martin uh updates on your end with uh shows and books and things like that uh not not uh not much to that i can recall but uh, of course there is the podcast history and five songs with martin popoff there's our youtube channel contrarians uh there's all all the books that i have are at martinpopoff.com Cool, cool. So uh, coming up here on the channel, folks, we've got uh, tomorrow the UK connection with Simon Bray and Stephen Reed and myself. We're going to be talking about our favorite and least favorite Saxon albums. This was really hard and a lot of fun. So hopefully you guys enjoy that uh, tomorrow. So start getting your list ready to put down in the comments uh, on that particular episode. We've also got tomorrow a, a very cool rank in the album show. We're going to be looking at our top 10. We're going to rank our top 10 albums from Miles Davis from the year 1965 to 1975. So he had a ton of albums throughout that period, both studio and live. 
the post bop stuff, the jazz fusion stuff, the funk stuff. Uh, we're going to pick our favorites among the studio and live albums. And that'll be with myself, Andy Edwards, and Chuck Alvarez. That's coming up tomorrow as well. And then we have on Sunday, we've got album homework assignment with Jim Baki and Guitar Hack. So uh, that also was a lot of fun. So stay tuned for that. And more here on the channel. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. I'm no longer talking about Twitter anymore because, quite frankly, I don't use it. And there's so much craziness going on with Twitter nowadays that, uh, that we're on Facebook and we're here on YouTube all together all the damn time. For Martin Popoff, I am Pete Pardo. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you at the Fun House next Friday. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.